Um, my talk is a little bit alternative. I normally do um, something called performance lecture, which means that I'll be performing as well as lecturing, but due to COVID, that's not something that I can do today. Um, that said, um, I've got some film interspersed with some memes because we're in 2020 and this is our culture, uh, as well as a, a little bit of playful politics and my own artwork. So I'm going to kick us all off with a compilation of videos taken from the Netflix series uh, Master of None. Weapon is to kill, disassemble, make dead, unacceptable. You have made many modifications upon your person, huh? You have come a long way for the Defense Department prototype. You betcha. It's the all-new Johnny Five. Just look at these items. You look, but you do not see. Killed a monkey brain. Where are you from? I am from India. That's covered engine. Oh! <laughs> Ooh, somebody's having a party. Sing, you got a classic rap, man. Yeah, in the back next to the onion. Where's the juice? No, 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 where's in the juice? Like I said, it was 7-Eleven. <laughs> Just be glad it did not buy a turkey sleepy. Put on fire, put on fire. Some call me the gangster of love. <laughs> I'm Raj, I'm a Bollywood producer, I'm looking for the most delicious thing on the planet. So I can see some cringy faces in the audience. Uh, and unlike all of these people, I am a woman and I really am brown. Um, and uh, yeah, so this uh, selection of uh, videos was a compilation I found in, like I said, the Netflix t series Master of None, which I highly recommend that you all watch. Uh, points out some really great issues in terms of race, society and culture that we currently live in at the moment. Um, and I suppose this gives you a kind of insight into my practice. So, um, Lots of people ask me, what kind of art do you make? Or what, what's your practice about? Or uh, what's your medium? Hopefully Bojo can help me answer that question today. I, well, I like to paint, um, or I make things. I like to... What do you make? I make... I have a thing where I make models of... I mean, when I was in like, well, Mayor of London, we build a beautiful... I make buses. You make models of buses? I make models of buses. See, they're going to be in the so, so what I do... No, what I do make models of buses, what I, I make is... I get, I get old... Um, I don't know, cr wooden crates. Yeah. Right? And then I paint them. And they, uh, and they have two, two I suppose it's a, wine, it's a box that's been used to contain two, two wine bottles, right? Right. And it will have a, 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 a dividing thing. Yeah. And I turn it into a bus, and I, so I, I put passengers. Uh, I... Yeah, so you get the idea. I... How do you really define practice and how do you really tell people about what you make i find this question so bizarre as an artist because I, you know i don't box myself up it's like you know when you have those uh ethnic oh, sorry those um what are they called the equal opportunities forms and you've got to tick a box are you british are you british asian are you uh, bisexual, are you heterosexual? What age group do you fall into? And you have to tick this kind of survey box to make sure, you know, everything's fair and equal when we know it's not. Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm sorry, Mr. Parson, curator, woman, whoever you are, I don't define myself by one thing. I am multiplicitous, and what I've been by multiplicitous, uh, some theory for you now, but uh, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, 20th century theorists, also male, <sighs> frustrating. Anyway, um, they uh, kind of talk about this idea of multiplicity being all things all at once simultaneously. So it's not binary, it's continuous, it's always growing like ginger offshoots here, there and everywhere. And I spoke with the lovely uh, Julie? Julia, Julia um, earlier on about this idea of going off in all sorts of directions and how that's perfectly acceptable and perfectly normal and pretty standard for art practice. And if someone was to ask me what's your art practice about, I'd say something like ginger. Yeah, because that's how random it can be. Uh, this is a lovely eye stock image because uh, copyright. 
um, of um, an Asian woman sweeping in India, and she's got there a jaru, which basically means broom. Um, and jarus in India are made from lots of kind of like combined materials, so they could be like coconut leaf uh, husks, or um, we've got some reeds over here, and there's a really nice, beautiful craft tradition. So whilst this might be a broom to the average person in India, it's craft for me. Um, and so that might give you a small insight. But then when I look at this image, I think uh, of kind of like my identity. And I think of this notion of being a woman, um, of craft built into kind of like our heritage. So the craft in the sari, the craft in the broom, but equally of labor systems and of class systems. And I think where in this kind of like hierarchical pyramid is this woman placed? Um, what is her, is her labor appreciated? Is it paid? These are all the kinds of questions that come to my mind. And so I would naturally uh, try to work from that. So where we have this artwork, um, this was performed at Strix Gallery in Birmingham. And um, although I did not make this broom, I bought it off the internet. Um, and it's a traditional jaru, and I'm sweeping uh, the gallery um, and thinking about those value systems and those labor systems, much like artists such as Merla Ukele's Lederman. Has anyone heard of Merla? Yeah, so um, she uh, mopped the entirety of a gallery um, for one of her performance pieces, and again, that comments on value and labor systems. Um, and also on something called intersectionality, which we'll come on to later, uh, and a very kind of feminist art practice. Um, yeah, so the idea of craft, the idea of making, the idea of gesture and performance, just from this one object. Um, and also humor, because things don't always need to be so serious. You've got to have fun, and you've got to have distance from your practice, which is a very hard thing to do um, when you're kind of commenting on politics. So uh, you may not be able to see it, but there's a little plant there, and that's called a curry plant, because when you touch it, um, some kind of like yellow substance comes off, and it smells like curry too. It smells beautiful, but yeah. As much as I'd like to hear Boris again. Um, and here's an image of me performing. I spent um, eight and a half hours, sort of average working day, outside um, Margaret Street School of Art in Birmingham. And this is my own form of institutional critique, if you like, uh, where I noticed that the staff at this school of art um, were all white, um, didn't represent me, but I was being taught an arts education by them. And when I look for people who shared similar experiences as me, um, they were unfortunately the black cleaners, which is a kind of, you know, it it's very much speaks of the time that we live in at the moment, which hasn't changed for the last 40 to 50 years. Um, and that kind of race, racial, systematic race or racial prejudice is still very prevalent in those kinds of systems. And you'll find that this exists in a lot of institutions. And I wanted to comment on that. So I spent eight and a half hours sweeping the steps of the School of Art. I had both the public and members of the School of Art um, tell me that I missed a spot. Uh, when can you come back and do my house? Um, why are you sweeping with that old thing? Um, even up until the dean of the School of Art, who said um, that he would love to see the video of it sometime. Um, <laughs> so it was a very politically uh, kind of driven piece. Um, and it raised many questions for me in my arts practice at the time. Um, and it shows how one simple craft-made object can then become performed, and the performability of that as well. Um, which is something I'm really interested in in practice. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about performance art, neither do I. I mean, I've got quite an extensive art history background, but performance art is something that none of us really claim as something that you know we're kind of like the pioneers of or anything like that. Um, it's just as like, you know, significant as paint. When you're all practicing with paint, the idea isn't to become the best painter there is in the world. It's to play and really experiment with materials, really get a feel of them, and try and work them to your advantage to get what you want from the material. And that's the way I see performance as a material for me. 
to practice with, to play with, and to try new ideas. So yeah, I just enjoy it. Unlike him, he's not having a great time. Uh, although my cat would love this, anyway. Um, and the next piece I'm gonna talk to you about, again, comments on labor systems. So um, you might have seen from the poster that Liam has made, very kindly, um, of the, the, the idea of a tea bike, or uh, kind of in Western terms, chai. It's actually called cha. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I've also heard the notion chai tea, which basically is just tea tea. Um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> just saying. Uh, and so um, again, I'm thinking about labor systems and class systems. Um, and uh, so these jar wallet go around um, in various parts of India, whether that's the village, whether that's the city, and they sell tea uh, to the public. Um, uh, yeah, so kind of riding around selling tea. And I was thinking about this idea and what that would mean in the city. And so I did the same. But instead, I gifted the tea um, to various people in and around the city. So I rode from the School of Art, around the art gallery, um, through Pigeon Park, through Cornwall Row and the financial district. That was not fun. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just up and down Birmingham. And I shouted, ja, 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 Bilo. That means come and have some tea with me. And um, I gave tea to lots of homeless, which was a really lovely, nice experience. Um, just passes by. One businessman stopped for a cuppa. And um, we shared discourse around race, again, and gender and social class and the origins of tea and the stories of tea um, and where the tea came from, but equally about my special recipe and spiced blend mix. Um, and this is me, you know, encouraging people to come and drink tea with me. And it wasn't the performance that was the artwork here. Neither was it this elaborate installation, neither was it the tea. The artwork for me was the discourse that I had with all of these people. So we, you know, we shared a lot of information together and it wasn't about um, me as a facilitator taking the stage or the platform. It was about me learning just as much as them. So learning from their stories, learning about their cultures and their heritage. And I find the one thing that's really important in my arts practice is this idea of creating space. And that's a metaphysical concept of space. Um, so room to grow, room to share, room to enjoy with one another, um, a collaborative arts practice with participants and other artists. And uh, this gentleman on the left gave me a 20 pound note, which was very nice. Um, and I'll just alert you to this um, little statue at the front, which is a statue of Guru Nanak, who turned 551 the other week. Um, and Guru Nanak is um, a Sikh guru, the oldest Sikh guru, and he taught us what it meant to, um, to share langar. Langar is the idea of gifting and sharing food, um, which is a prevalent part of Sikh culture. Um, and so he blessed us on this day, and we were able to share three cups of tea with the public. Now I'm gonna tell you how to make a proper cup of tea with my wonderful Gujarati friend, Hitain Patel. Welcome to my kitchen. Uh, today, we're gonna to be showing you how to make a proper cup of tea. Now, ideally, we would have had a proper English person to show us how, but we didn't have the budget for that, so we've got Alan here instead. Now, technically, he's not from round here, but he were born here, and he does make a great cup of tea. Now, he don't speak English, so I'll be translating for him. Okay. Alan, welcome. Welcome. Kettle, cup, chai, dude, ne sugar. Tamati koribi Indian chai waprisaki. Okay. So you say you've got to get all your stuff together first, your milk and your sugar, your cup and tea. Uh, and you can use any good tea, but today we're going to be using this one because it's English. Apreto chas chuti chai wapriye, pan apre jaldi machi etle, 
આપણે ચાયની બેગ વાપરવાના છે ઉકારેલું પાણી કપમાં મૂકવાનું ચાયની બેગ તમારા કપમાં મૂકવાનું પછી દેખાશે કે પાણી ચાયને લઈને બહુ સરસ રંગ આપશે Okay, so what he's saying is uh, once you chuck it in, you'll notice that this beautiful white casing is keeping the dirk tea in its place where it belongs. You know, it's got these strong borders on it, stop them from getting out. Because ideally what you want to do is extract all the goodness, but without them floating around in our waters. And don't worry about this mucky brown colour. We'll sort that out later. All right. હવે આપણે ત્રીસ સેકન્ડ માટે પાણીમાં રાખવાનો પાણી ને ચાય બાને આવે મિક્સ થઈ જશે તમે યાદ કરો કે રામ સીતાનો પ્રેમ વાઢવામાં સામે તો લાગેલો કે યા સો ડોન્ટ લીવ ઇટ સ્ટ્યુન ફોર ટુ લોંગ થર્ટી સેકન્ડ ઇઝ વે ટુ લોંગ લોંગ યુ લીવ ઇટ ઇન ઇટ્સ જસ્ટ ગોન ગેટ બ્રાઉનર એન્ડ બ્રાઉનર એન્ડ મોખીએ આ શું જાય છે મને આવી રીતના પીવાનું મજા આવે પણ તમને પસંદ હોય તો શુગર નાખજો કે થોડું દૂધ મૂકવાનું ને ચાય કરવીને લાગશે ઓકે સો ના ઇઝ હેર વેર વી ફિક્સ ધ કલર પ્રોબ્લેમ સો વોટ યુ વોન્ટ ડુ ઇઝ ગેટ મેની વાઇટ થિંગ્સ ઇઝ યુ ગોટ રકિંગ અરાઉન્ડ એડ યુ નો ચોક ઇટ ઓલ ઇન ધ ટી સો ઇફ યુ ગોટ સમ મિલ્ક હિયર If you've got some cream, stick it in. If you've got white sugar, put plenty more the better. Don't forget that milk will stop the inside of your cup from getting stained. There's nothing worse than white on the outside and brown on the inside. Know what I mean? No sugar, chemical sate, bleach curry li hoi, ne apresaria mate karabje. Hmm. Okay. So you'll notice we're not using brown sugar here because as we all know, white is is more refined. Ajo, ik tum saras chai. Tamne kai bi badlu hoy, to tomara ti karai. Okay, so here we've got a nice cup of tea. Now, it's still a little too dark for my liking, but mistakes can happen in live demos like this. But thankfully, we have got a perfect cup of tea that we made earlier. And there you go. So, Thanks a lot for watching. If you found that useful, don't forget to hit the like button. And then subscribe. Uh, I'm actually not sure what that means, but uh, don't forget to subscribe if you want more videos. Okay, thanks. Bye. So, that might be a bit cringy for a lot of you, <laughs> but for me, that's satire on so many levels. Um, And I think it's because of the language element there going on as well. So it's quite absurd as well, because we're seeing this Yorkshire lad speaking Gujarati. And although I don't speak Gujarati, I understand certain elements of it. Um, and he was saying the exact opposite of Hittain's translation. So a uh, very funny piece. But um, yeah, satire is very important, and we should always use that to our advantage. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit. Oh, wait. Well, Who knows what intersectionalism is? Anyone want to give some... Uh, uh, go on, Leanne, go on, give us a... Oh, right. I cringe, I put my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> go on, John. Well, it's, it's a term that was brought up by black feminists uh, to talk about the difference between hierarchies of oppression. So if you're a black person or a black woman and relative to other identities, how those... Um, There's a relative to each other, so it's about hierarchies yeah. of oppression. And I can't remember the person who coined it. It literally was a question of an intersection where the likelihood of being subject to violence or a car crash or... So your, the degree of your, the likelihood of you being subject to social violence or social oppression has to do with the degree of intersection between the different identities that you're part of. Exactly. Um, and the, to- the term was coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in the 70s who later went on to develop it as a feminist theory. Um, so when I think about intersectionalism within the, within the arts, I wonder, firstly, uh, is there no room for me in certain institutions because I'm a woman? 
or is there no room for me in certain institutions because of my cultural background? And that's essentially uh, something that I continue to critique within my practice. And here's a nice little meme. Um, yeah, so essentially I am Fry from Futurama um, and I'm just trying to work out whether it's sexist or racist or both, who knows. Um, so yeah, so thinking about Hitain Patel's performance, this started to make me think about my own performance um, and I think about uh, like Indian cooking channels or perhaps, um, God, why can't I think of her name? Sexy TV chef, Boots, Nigella. loves food. Nigella, the wonderful Nige. Um, and her kind of role uh, in her cookery programs, but also the, the cookery programs that I grew up watching with my mom, which had this kind of like 1990s Indian chef who was all about kind of like the spices and herbs. And yeah, of course, he was a man. Anyway, um, so um, I did my own YouTube channel and I taught people how to make alu alu parata, which are basically uh, potato stuffed flatbreads. Um, and just thinking about the way in which Hitain also uses public platforms. So we think about socially engaged art practice and we think, right, okay, uh, we need to be out in the public realm. We need to be performing in public with people. You know, we've got YouTube, we've got screens, uh, we've got like all these different outlets for entertainment. And uh, I see YouTube as a socially engaged platform for us to create socially engaged artworks and performances that face the public, but face the public on a wider scale. Uh, unfortunately, it's on the internet, so if you do mess up, it's kind of stuck there. Um, <laughs> that's the only downside. Um, but yeah, so thinking about that performability and who the public is and who our audiences are can work in so many different ways. Um, and I think as a contemporary artist, these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about more, especially in times like the pandemic, where our resources to people and to real life situations are so skewed. And there's so many opportunities lying around in the internet that we really must take advantage of. Um, this is another piece of, um, that I did earlier on last year. Um, as well as using the digital world, I'm really interested in sort of tax uh, tactile objects and things that I've made with my hands and the craft practice. So being able to be a multiplicitous uh, person culturally, but being able to be a multiplicitous person um, who uses a variety of mediums and a variety of materials in which to express myself. So um, Sapili Wood turned on a traditional lathe and this um, rolling pin, which is also called a velna, um, is actually 1.2 meters in length. And the idea of it is actually, again, collaboration. So uh, growing up um, in my household, uh, my mom would be cooking rutti and she would be doing that on her own. So traditionally in most South Asian households, the rutti maker is the last person to sit at the dining table and to eat their dinner because they are the kind of uh, the chef of the house, if you like. And those rottis need to be fresh and risen and nice and crispy and beautiful. So they make that sacrifice and they cook on their own. This piece is kind of um, around uh, the idea of collaboration in rotti making. So the reason it was designed and made so big was that you could have two rotti makers who would work together in unison um, there's also some humor in it, and I'm yet to perform and to find someone worthy of making those ruttis with me. Um, and to have that collaborative act of rolling out those ruttis and making them together so that when the last person to come and eat is uh, on the table, they've got someone to eat with. So there's something nice in that, there's something humorous in that, but equally it's kind of commenting on the traditional um, ideas surrounding craft and craftsmanship and all those lost skills that we have. Um, again, another collection of crafted brooms, some found, some bought, some gifted, and some made. Um, and the position I took with this body of work uh, called Sweep um, was the idea of unity throughout culture. So we've got um, a traditional English broom, uh, a Filipino broom, a Chinese broom, a Dutch broom, the Indian jaru, a Romanian broom, I believe that's another Spanish broom. Um, and then we've got a British kind of sweeping brush. But the, the idea that of these brooms and something that I really enjoyed about 
looking at these crafted objects was that they all had individual purposes. So the Dutch broom uh, fourth from the end over this side was actually to sweep out corners in steps. I found that very cute. Um, and again, it's uh, thinking about those labor systems that we have as women, as working class, and how we kind of lose the, I don't know, the romance in those things because of the idea of that type of work. Um, but equally, it's about bringing together so many cultures and finding the, the element of unity and what brings those cultures together and that kind of like underlying th thread that, bring, that ties them all together. Um, these were shown at Icon Gallery in Birmingham um, alongside a bed and lots of kitchen objects that I had made. And here's another shot. Just thinking about methods of display. So um, when John introduced me earlier, he spoke about something called cultural dysphoria, which is a relatively new phenomenon. And cultural dysphoria is, uh, so you must have heard of gender dysphoria. Um, cultural dysphoria, when we think about gender dysphoria, is the kind of pain, the anguish, um, the anxieties of being associated with a certain culture that you don't feel affiliated with. Um, and as a theorist, as well as an artist, I am trying to bring light to this theory through some PhD research. Um, and it will be kind of pioneered through uh, a psychoanalysis lens, but also a phenomenological lens through practice. And so what I do is I try to bring um, uh, objects or artworks where I uh, feel senses of lack of belonging or perhaps um, they, you know, they don't align with my cultural beliefs. And bring those together to think about my own kind of experiences um, as someone from uh, multiple backgrounds. Um, and during the 90s, there was a massive uh, movement uh, called the Black Arts Group, um, which was also contributed to um, by a lot of South Asian artists, so the likes of Fuminda Kaur, uh, the likes of Shitaba Biswas, and various others. Um, which you can all go away and research because I'm sure you're dying to know who they are. Um, and again, this 90s movement was pioneered by um, some fantastic black artists. But along the fringes of that movement existed those South Asian women who contributed to that um, because of the lack of um, kind of belonging they had, but also the displacement that they had in Britain, uh, being British born. Um, and contributing to the arts movements over here. Um, and since the 90s, that research has remained relatively untouched. And we're in 2020 now. And I look back at some of those interviews with those artists, and the issues that they're facing are relatively unchanged. They, they are still as ripe as they were back then. And so um, part of my artist research is kind of bringing some of those issues back to the forefront and looking at what we can do uh, 30 years on with arts practice. Um, so that's a little bit about my theory. Um, this, um, again, is another uh, kind of object that uh, kind of um, culminates or brings together theories of multiplicity. Um, so this manja, which essentially translates as a daybed, I, I don't know how to translate it, actually. I'm going to leave that there. Um, because this object has multiple uses. It's uh, a bed to sleep on. It's also a table to dry your vegetables. Um, it is uh, somewhere where my great-grandma used to dry her clothes and where all the key decisions in the village were made. And this object is key to most Punjabi households in India. So when I think of it, I think about my childhood. I think about various different notions of home, of belonging, of waking up in the morning or lying in the sun. I used to have a little black Labrador and I used to lie them on my belly and grab my grandma's scarves and lie them on top and we used to lie in the sun and it was a glorious thing. Um, and so I really wanted to make one and I did. Anyway, uh, the multiplicity of this object was something that I initially began thinking about. But with performance at the core of my practice, not trying to box myself, um, I started to think about the performability of this object and the narratives that it held. Um, and so I, uh, well, this one happened by chance. 
So um, these two gentlemen were the fire marshals um, at a set of apartments in Edgebaston. They were employed because this building built five years ago actually has the same cladding in it that Grenfell Tower had. Um, so they are unfortunately on a night watch there. Um, and uh, yeah, whilst that is a story in and of itself, I lived there for a short while this year and um, the fire marshals were passing as I was building this object on my front drive and then began talking to me about an exact same object that their grandparents used to build when they were kids and having the exact same purposes. So again, like Sweep, the, um, the group of brooms, it was an idea of connecting with someone from a different culture based on a memory that they shared too. Um, and I started to think about storytelling and this kind of thread that runs through my arts practice but also this idea of performability and how to capture those stories and how to collect them and bring them all together, again, in the form of a social arts practice. And so um, the story's been recorded uh, and written down, and uh, these images will be shown later next year uh, as a part of um, an arts festival. And along with those stories and those narratives, they'll be present with each of the... Um, the touring munja, if you like. Um, that's a short image of it um, carried on my car, which again is another form of performability. I wish I'd put a bit better picture up now. Um, and yeah, it was just cable tied to the top of my car and rode around various places in Birmingham, um, collecting again those stories. So instead of tea this time, it's a bed. Um, I'll play this one for you and then I'll talk about it a little bit. So, um, yeah, the reason I wanted to play all of that is because as much as it was a learning process for the audience, it was also my first time learning how to um, speak the Punjabi alphabet. Um, despite growing up and being born here, um, no, sorry, despite being born here, I grew up in Punjab, um, but I wasn't exposed to the education over there. So when I came over here, I forgot how to speak Punjabi completely, um, and I was dropped into primary school and then later learnt Punjabi again and it became a form of you know, communication for me. Now I'm absolutely fluent, but I just can't read and write it because um, their alphabet contains, well, the other alphabet for me contains 35 letters. Uh, they don't look anything like the English alphabet. Um, they're based on a Sanskrit alphabet, but equally um, they're, they're, there are no direct letter translations. And this is what I was kind of talking about earlier in terms of translation and this idea of carrying one culture into another and another culture into another one and then not quite making sense or quite pairing up. And this idea of translation is something that follows through my practice as well. So you'll notice a lot of the artworks have uh, Punjabi titles. And the reason I don't translate them into English is because sometimes there isn't a direct translation and part of decolonizing arts practice is ensuring that you keep your kind of indigenous roots there and your original languages and texts. Um, and so um, this is another one of those performance lectures that I was telling you about um, where I facilitated a Punjabi alphabet lesson in the School of Art in Birmingham. I was able to subvert the traditional hierarchies of a traditional lecture theater, enabled everyone to sit on the floor in a group setting environment we played with flashcards, we also sung songs, but most of all, we learnt the Punjabi alphabet together. Um, we also learnt how to write our names in Punjabi, which was a really nice gift. Um, this artwork was built of cushions, rugs, exercise books, and flashcards. 
um, as well as an iPad presentation. And it's just another form of kind of like pedagogical um, outputs and also performance. Um, so yeah, you must be able to tell now I quite like changing my role. I've worked in supermarkets, I work as a, a fine art lecturer, I work as um, in an art gallery, I also you know, make and exhibit artworks, but I like to tell stories and fulfill all sorts of different career aspirations through residencies. So um, I did an online residency last year, sorry this year, God, <laughs> yeah, that's telling isn't it? Um, yeah, um, where I read out stories, famous children's stories, uh, very renowned uh, children's stories. You can probably tell what that one is. Anyone? Cat in the Hat. Cat in the Hat. Yeah. So uh, Philip Nell wrote a fantastic book called Was the Cat in the Hat Black? Uh, where he commented on the illustrations used, but also um, the idea of the white gloves. I don't know, that's a recurring motif in most kind of... Um, uh, Piccanini styled drawings and illustrations um, and that so I spent some time telling those stories but giving them a new lens uh, here's another one where I retold the story of um, the little prince is anyone familiar yeah it's a good little favorite of mine um, and uh, Herman Sultan is um, a literary professor and he revisited uh, The Little Prince and wrote about everything that Anton de Saint-Exupéry missed, who was the author of this book. And he wrote um, The Little Prince and the Five Planets of Racism. And the planets that uh, The Little Prince in this series re re visited was the planet of the historian, the planet of the scientist, the planet of the philosopher, the planet of the politician and the planet of the economist. So you can imagine what kinds of tales unfold. But it was really beautifully written uh, in the exact same style as the book with those kind of like naive illustrations and those naive uh, kind of questioning of, but why? And so um, I acted that out on um, a screen uh, for a residency. Um, and again, that was another form of uh, facilitating discourse in the public realm. Um, this is another work of mine, which is called The Anthropology of the Self, um, inspired by uh, kind of that idea of storytelling, but a very introverted work. This uh, work I'm showing you because um, it led to me winning the Tate Liverpool Award, a bit of self-promotion there, it's not illegal. Um, uh, so I'm just going to play a short, short snippet from it and allow you to enjoy that. You'll hear a very silent, echoey sound in the back.
Yeah, so that was just a short clip of the film, but you can see it takes a very different approach to some of my other works. It is more quiet, uh, more reflective, um, and allows the audience to embody the text. Um, the actual film was shown on three projectors in a fully immersive space. So when viewers enter the space, they are met with only the projectors um, and the text and various scenes and imagery. Um, the full film is 15 minutes long and can be found on my website if you want to have a look at it later. Um, and in the crazy 2020 that we've all had, it allows a moment for pause and reflection, but again, facilitates that element of discourse in terms of race, gender and social class, albeit inside your own head this time. Um, so a very different way of working, uh, but still has the same sort of impact as some of the other works. Um, and here's my favorite theorist. Her name is Donna Haraway. Uh, Donna Haraway um, is my absolute idol. She loves uh, all things cyborg and swimming and crazy. Um, and she often talks about this idea of narrative and storytelling and how it's important to our survival on Earth. Um, it's often critiqued, uh, her work, but equally she's a pioneering um, researcher in terms of ecology and also in terms of feminism. So I urge you all to have a look at her. She inspires my work around staying with ideas of the trouble, um, which is also one of her books. Um, but equally, um, thinking about alternative ways to tell story or to facilitate story in order for social change. And I'm not being naive. I don't think I'm going to change the world. But uh, you know, to elicit some change is something. Um, so going back uh, not that long ago, when you're an artist, everything seems like years and years and years. And I'm sure that later on in life, I'll look back and it will, really will be years. Um, uh, but this seems like a lifetime ago. Um, another form of social practice, uh, which Luke and I were talking about earlier. Luke uh, very nicely visited. Um, and this was held at Strix Gallery. It was um, originally intended to be a game swap between artist Fred Hubble and I. And um, Fred and I spoke about um, uh, cultural appropriation. And it's a really sticky subject. And we thought about ways to kind of counteract cultural appropriation, but equally ways of sharing and exchanging culture that doesn't become problematic. So this game that we played here is called Pitu, which I played as a kid in Punjab and contains seven stones and some tennis balls. And Fred said, OK, well, if you're going to teach me how to play Pitu, then I want to teach you a game. And we spoke about all the different games that he could teach me. But being somewhat British myself, I didn't understand the point in that. So then we really reflected and went back to the drawing board and then realized the importance again in creating space. And so not only did this become um, a lesson for him on how to play the game, but also allowed me to have space as a woman of color to share heritage and stories and to facilitate that discourse for Fred. So instead of exchanging the game, we just left it as one simple transaction. And in return, I was met with empathy, morality, encouragement, and those are the things that are needed when being gifted an aspect of someone's culture. Also, we'd like to think. Um, and so we tore down the white cube space, um, filled it with sand, brought a couple of rocks and tennis balls in, and invited people to come and learn and play the game, um, allowing audiences to participate within the artwork. Uh, alongside um, throwing tennis balls at each other, we also handbound um, a collection of childhood games. Um, so uh, alongside the rules of our own game, we collected stories. We've got stories from Somalia, Germany, uh, Pakistan, um, some from the UAE, um, all over the world, Romania, you name it. Uh, there's about 14, 15 stories in there all together, and they're all like childhood games. We kept them in their original languages, but we also included translations so that um, there was an element of accessibility there. Um, and this brought together many audiences because I found that I played the game that Bruno played in Portugal, which was marbles, which obviously a lot of us associate with. 
And there's often this kind of element of, well, that's from my culture, or that's from my culture. And whilst that is problematic to assume that something is being stolen, uh, which it often is, um, it's also nice to think about the connections that we also have with one another. And children are very innocent. Um, there's this really nice kind of um, beautiful element of me being able to share something that I did whilst Leanne might have done something as a kid as well. Um, and loads of us have these like tiny stories which connect to each other. Um, so again, thinking about unity as well as difference. Um, and future work, this game is called Pachisi. It's a sewn mat, um, also known as Ludo. Many of you probably play the game Frustration, getting all your counters home. Um, this work is currently being built into a large mat so that it can be played by many audiences in an immersive gallery space again. Um, and giant uh, plastic counters um, so that uh, audience members can physically move around the artwork and play with it in that sense. Um, and it's a work being developed for 2022, so it's a little bit of future in there. Um, and again, it's the idea of coming together through gameplay and commu community and collaboration. Um, and I think I'm getting to the end of my talk, so I kind of want to leave you on a little note, which is don't box yourselves up. <laughs> Make any work you want. You can be a printmaker, a painter, a performer, a filmmaker, all of these things all at once. Play, have fun, you're all at uni, this is the best time to play before someone writes up a review and all of a sudden you're only a painter. Try everything, because it's time, the best time to play. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So, we've got some time for questions, or if anybody has any. I know it really takes a little bit of time to get to us, but that's cool. Shall I start the ball rolling? Is that to take, you know, to log it in? So great. Thank you so much for that. Brilliant. Thank um, you. Okay, I am, um, there's a documentary on Netflix at the moment called Feminist, What Were They Thinking? Mm -hmm. Which is a slightly, you know, um, demeaning title, but it turns out it's an amazing. I don't know if you've seen it, but the question it raises is, you know, there's references to Martha Rosler and I'm seeing Adrian Piper, and I'm wondering what your relationship is to that generation of feminist artists that came up through the 70s and what, for a woman of your generation, a woman of colour, how you relate to that, that, that legacy. I think there's an element of relation, but it's also foolish to think that the experiences are going to be identical. Uh, coming from an intersectional perspective, there are elements of culture that will naturally uh, change the way that I think about those artists, but equally, uh, without giving too much godlike presence to those artists, they did pave a way in society for that conversation to arise and to begin. Um, Martha Rosler and the likes of Merla Lady Ukelis, um, I often reference within my work. I think it's quite uh, interesting to reference art, but not just to make art that references art, because, you know, appropriation, it's been done. Um, so, thinking about where those feminists sat in that time, but thinking about where we are now, the work that might need to be done, the work that will need to be done for the future, and the work that already has been done, because without acknowledging that, we're almost acting as if nothing has happened, when something really interesting has happened. And whilst mine and perhaps Leanne's and Julia's experiences might not be the same, there is that element of connectivity and that sisterhood which originally emerged from feminism back then. And I know that a lot of cultures now uh, kind of um, pit women against each other in this competition to be who can be the strongest or who can be the most successful when it kind of goes against the original feminist beliefs. So they are very inspiring. I often reflect on the work of Adrienne Piper even today. Um, and some of the work that she has done uh, back in the 70s is still very prominent and still very kind of like uh, high, uh, um, highly important today, so they shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you. Hello. Hi, uh, okay. um, thank you. That was really, really informative and really enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, this kind of word, play, keeps kind of coming back and 
into the talk at various different points and in different kind of contexts. And um, I kind of wondered if you might just kind of talk a little bit about how the notion of like playing kind of comes into your kind of creative process. Um, in as much as that how if you kind of if you have an initial idea, how that might kind of develop into a resolved piece of work and um, kind of where playing I think um, a lot of people might argue that work is never resolved. Um, and I know that's a really annoying thing to say, but I too am of that belief. So I, I reflect back on so many of my previous artworks and I think about how I can develop them further or where they can be pushed next. Because when a piece of work dies, it, there's often nothing left to do with it and it just kind of becomes nothing. Um, so I think the success in a piece of artwork is being able to play with it for years and years to come. And it kind of really stands the test of time, both for the artist and for the audience. Play works for me on many levels. So it works in terms of process, but it also works in terms of output. So how much uh, involvement I have with play at the start or in between the journey, but equally once the artwork is made, who will play with it next, or how will they interact with it? Traditionally, art has been seen on walls uh, or in forms of sculpture, and it, or you know, we've got film, we've got moving image now, we have all these technologies. Um, the artist is expected to sit, view, watch, interact with it, but they're never really touching, sharing, talking about it with someone else unless it's in a review or a conversation. And so for me as an artist, I think it's really important that the audience has that element as well, where they can be part of the artwork and understand some of the processes that the artist has. Previously, in like previous generations, there has been this kind of like mystique of the so-called artist. I really believe in breaking down that barrier of the mystique where, you know, such and such is sitting there with a suit on and no one knows what his work is about or how to engage, but they pass comment and, you know, hmm, very nice, whatever. Um, you know, that kind of generation is very much gone, been and gone. And what is the role of an artist today? It's, you know, some of them make a lot of money and sit in a really like high glass chamber and some of them are on the ground doing the work with the public. Um, and I think that's what all good socially engaged arts practice should do, to play and to allow others to play. <laughs> Um, that's a really good question and I can't pretend that I know all the answers because uh, I'm only speaking for myself here um, and you know India is a very secular place it's full of all sorts of cultures and creeds and religions and all sorts for me personally um, I like to be asked questions which aren't like prudent or rude so the old kind of like where are you from that doesn't sit well with anyone. Um, but, you know, tell me more about that festival. I want to learn more. That kind of encourages this idea that you genuinely care. And I think it is very much based on systems around care and learning and education. But when we think about care, learning and education, we think about how those should be met. So if we kind of put ourselves in the kind of role of a teacher or someone who has to kind of think about their students in a certain way and make sure that they're looked after, then you need to ensure that there's, like for me personally, I always try to ensure that there's an element of empathy. So you can kind of pick up on when someone's being offensive or not. Um, but equally, I really pride myself on explaining things to people because I think that, not that it's my responsibility, um, but I think there's something beautiful going on there, some kind of relationship being played out someone who genuinely wants to know more about your culture or a certain tradition that they find beautiful. And if uh, a kind of code of contract, non-verbal or verbal, was to be agreed, then it was something like, you know, if I tell you a bit about this, then you won't profit off that in any way. You won't go ahead and make loads of like paisley scarves and put like Hindu symbols on them and sell them at a market stall and depreciate, depreciate the value of that culture. So you're essentially being given something that could be gifted. And when you're gifted something, you treat it with respect and care, unless you're nominated, you're a really shitty jumper. So yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers the question slightly. Hello. 
was really interested in your uh, Sufi in interpretation, Sufi engaged practice, particularly in the community on YouTube. I was just wondering, how do you interact on YouTube? Uh, how do you get feedback? So presumably your projects are very much about talking to people, engaging in some fascinating things you've done. I love your tea bike, it's wonderful. Okay. Uh, just really wait to get alongside people and, and to share something that is really a terrific story. How does that work in so, I think as artists, we're quite fortunate, but also it's a bit of a burden because we're kind of working about three or four jobs, if you like. We're both the artists, the marketing team, the curators, the tech, the kind of all those different things going on. And you really have to, you'd think you'd have to master all those trades. You only need to really master one, and that's your arts practice. The rest kind of come in and fit in sideways somehow. And so for me, it's about marketing. Uh, and I'm not talking about putting up some posters and advertising, but I also am. So uh, when I've facilitated things before, um, and they've been on YouTube, I'll use every piece of social media that I have to put the message out there. I'll even send out evites because um, you know, I said evites. So you know, I'll bow up an email together and think about all the meaningful connections that I've had on online or in person with people. So, for example, I've met a few people at, from my time working at Icon Gallery, my previous tutors, uh, other artists that I really look up to. Send them an email, um, put in what you're doing on YouTube. And the beauty of YouTube is that they can enter it at any time. So if it was live initially, you know, that's kind of done its job. But equally, that link will be there for some time to come. And you can share that. Uh, you know, social media is, is a great tool. Um, to kind of get the message out there and to continue to promote yourself. And we do have to promote ourselves. And the, the business card is almost redundant now, um, especially in COVID, because it's kind of like passing on a disease, I suppose. Um, but, you know, it's just thinking about all these different unique ways that we have um, to make art and to keep sharing that message. And so I'd say market the hell out of it. Uh, don't be afraid if it only gets a few views at the first time round. Um, that video that Hitain Patel did, um, his first few sets of videos, I've had a look at them, they've only had like 30 or 40 views. That one has 4 million or something. I'm just plucking a number out. Yeah, it's got a million and something. Um, and so, you know, it's about those kind of tools that you use to market it. Um, the words you use are really important because not only are you prescribing yourself to those words, but they are keywords that will pop up in Google searches and different things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Do you have any more? Um, yeah, I'm good. Please. Brilliant talk, by the way. Yes. I also tuned into your Strix residency, which was also really great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask how important is accessibility to you in your practice because you can kind of see that from you know outside looking in anyway, but like you use very accessible things in terms of language and the way you engage people and even going to like using you know games from childhood or reading children's stories and reinterpreting them and the language in them. So I'm just interested in what you Accessibility is the, are really important, but equally it costs money too. Yeah. So I thought about the things that I did um, and where I've got a budget, I will allow for. So for example, I did a workshop with Strix um, and we paid for a BSL interpreter um, and also um, three, I think it was four linguists um, from Polish background, um, from uh, uh, an Urdu background, I think it was Punjabi and Czech as well as quite like kind of key spoken languages for the Strix audience. Um, and we had that translated, again that cost money. Um, and you know, no art is made without having that money there. Um, you know, if you ever want to know anything about funding, you can email me later. But we applied for um, Birmingham City Arts Council funding. Um, and I'll, actually, I'll just. There we go. Um, contact details. Uh, we used um, the council funding to put back into the artwork to ensure that it had um, those kinds of like accessibility outlets, as well as like um, language and culture. I think uh, disability isn't spoken about enough, and you know, COVID has been a funny one because whilst it's closed a lot of doors for many people, it's allowed many able 
able-bodied and able-minded people to uh, to understand the art world for what it must be like for someone who is disabled. Um, so, you know, uh, suddenly workplaces are able to offer working from home facilities and all these different kinds of op opportunities are arising. And whilst that sparks a lot of anger for the disabled community, it also kind of speaks of all the opportunities that are there. And I think as a practitioner or as some sort of facilitator, and if you are having a socially engaged practice, you need it to kind of make sure it can speak to a wide range of audiences as opposed to a select or minute few. Um, just because if you're talking about things like social class, race, gender, etc., that needs to speak to a wide range of people. But equally, we shouldn't be singling uh, specific audiences out or, you know, allowing the most privileged to privilege again off that system. So, yeah, it is really important. And it's just about finding ways to ensure that financially I as an artist can cope with that demand but equally um, that, you know, uh, audiences also have that ability to join in. Um, can, you, can I do one more question? Of course. Um, I was very intrigued by your um, interest in multiplicity and that you're speaking kind of somewhat against the box ticking exercises of ethnicity and gender. Mm -hmm. So how we can you just say a little bit more about how you understand the tension between multiplicity and identity as a box ticking exercise? So identity as a boxing exercise is something that's very binary. Um, my identity as, well, I'm not indigenous, but my ancestors were and, you know, so that idea of gender and sexuality and all those things become boxes in which to confine a person. Creativity has like multiple outlets and I'm just speaking about the art specifically now or in terms of philosophy and kind of like if we're trying to understand our own sense of being. Boxing ourselves up kind of like reduces things down and Deleuze and Guattari spoke about multiplicity as this continuity, something which continuously evolves and grows. And when we look at kind of reducing down to boxes, we're only ever moving down. Multiplicity allows us to move up. Um, and so for me, that kind of chimes the most true in terms of my art practice, the mediums I choose, but my identity too. Um, and whilst I've defined myself as a British Asian, in the box ticking exercise, that's exactly what I am. But if I was to choose my own box, I'd say I was Punjabi because I equally don't agree with all of the politics of India at the moment or ever have done. Um, and whilst I have two passports, both a British and an Indian passport, neither of them speak of who I am as a person. Um, so whilst all of these kind of characteristics in the kind of diversity monitoring form are there and are sometimes useful for surveys and working things out. Equally, they're very binary and anything that is binary is always going to reduce in a stop or a zero. And that's the way I see it as a, an artist. Right, thank you. I mean, unless there's any more questions, I think uh, it's been really... Oh, one more, I'll say it, yeah. Hi. Would you say that uh, your practice is a gentle way of protest? Sorry? Would you say that your practice is a gentle way of protest? That's a really nice way of putting it. I might steal that for later. Yeah, um, definitely. I definitely think back to when I was performing at the School of Art and doing those types of institutional critique, which is a whole kind of art period in itself. Um, the idea of silently sweeping on those stairs is very much a form of protest, but it's not kind of you know, loud or violent or in your face in the kind of like literal sense. Um, so yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. Thank you. Stealing that. What's your name? Do I need to reference you? <laughs> okay, thank you for having me.